I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Um, first of all, uh, good evening, and thank you all for having me. Um, I appreciate that that there were some accolades or some appreciation for me flying in, but the reality is is that I'm very appreciative of having been invited. Uh, particularly for this issue. And I know we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to do, do this as quick as I can so we have as much time to talk and then I'll hang out. We can rap as much as you want. But in terms of the presentation, I'm going to try to keep this to more or less 30 minutes. Um, because, but but my, I'm appreciative because for the better part of 10 years, the myth of buying power has become personally for me a pet peeve. Uh, that I've been trying to tackle. And I've, uh, for a number of reasons, I don't know that it's all about um, just me, but for a number of reasons, there has been a, a huge pushback and resistance in my, my limited attempts to, to get this into the kind of conversation, uh, the level of conversation I think we need to have. And it started for me when I was um, a young wannabe revolutionary sitting in meetings like this. And invariably, there would be someone who would get up either as a presenter or uh, making a comment from the audience and who would repeat the refrain that we're going to talk a little bit about today, which is that we have, uh, whether you know over time it's the, the number's gone up, but as it is today, we have a trillion dollars in buying power. And if we were to just pull that money and spend it more wisely and stop buying hair and rims and shoes, Weed. huh? Weed. Weed. Oh man, if we stopped buying weed, good lord, we would be rich and then we would be free. Uh, so the question that Aislinn was, was raising just a moment ago, I want to quickly answer from my perspective now that no, there cannot be freedom under a capitalist economy. Now, the, 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 the variations or degrees of unfreedom are specified and tailored to different groups and African people have a particular relationship to capital in this country and around the world, but no one can be free. Uh, uh, by what I understand the term to mean under a capitalist economy. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, and then uh, it's, a, it's a very stripped down version of this, um, and uh, uh, we'll we'll do the best we can and uh, see what we can get to. I want to say also from the start that I'm not an economist. Um, by academic training, I'm an Africana studies or media studies scholar, and I've been really reworking my approach to this over the last maybe year or so um, to make it more of a focus on uh, as an issue of propaganda than one of economics. Yeah. Uh, the economics are real, but but I, I'm just telling you how I'm approaching it. Um, uh, but anyway, so let's let's just see what we what we get here. So I do. I start with in in, in the broader work I've tried to, to 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 do, and we can come back to this in conversation if we have time. My approach is one of colonialism uh, or internal colonialism as it relates to African or Black people in this country, uh, or what Kwame Nkrumah called uh, um, the practice of capitalism. He said, if you practice capitalism, that's domestic colonialism. And I think it's important to approach, for me at least, all these issues under that rubric because it takes us away, particularly from how we understand this country, uh, um, from conversations about democracy, freedom, equality, or even the potential for there to be success or liberation within a capitalist economy. That if you understand what colonialism is, its application or use of an economic system like capitalism uh, 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 prohibits it from being anything other than what it is, which is something that greatly creates an quality. So, uh, oh, the background doesn't show up on here either? That sucks, because even more fresh stuff on here. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so, so, um, and I just like to always remind people, particularly in, in is sort of my, my appreciation for Pan-Africanism, that we always have to remember that as, as black America, as we know it, was being formed, all the other colonies of, of African people were being formed around the world. As, as Europe was colonizing Africa, uh, uh, so-called Latin America, the so-called Caribbean, and the rest of the world, black America was also being formed. So again, it was a particular experience, but it was part of a global imperialist move that was, was taking place around, uh, taking, uh, uh, um, a place around the globe. So when I end up with, with various uh, elements of the diaspora, particularly in my classroom, I like to remind people to the extent that there's these tendencies away from Pan-Africanism to be reminded that Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, um, Jamaica, uh, uh, Panama are all as inauthentic as 
spaces and places as black America if we're looking for something authentically African. That, In other words, black America is as much a faux creation as all these geopolitical entities and nation states. There's nothing real about any of them other than um, what they were created for, which is to help European imperialism. Um, every, every country on the planet is, is, is indirectly or directly a re response to that. Um, and then within that context, media, as those in power have often described it, media are used for, for what they call full spectrum dominance. That is, media are not entertainment, they are not uh, uh, innocuous, they are designed and, and used for very specific political imperial purposes. And by full spectrum dominance, they just mean that just like they want to use the military to control the, the, you know, the land and the sea and the air with the Air Force, they want to control outer space with the space program, and they also want to control cyberspace, full spectrum dominance. Or simply as Fanon put it, colonialism is the entire conquest of land and people, that is all. So I just like to quickly set that tone because that's what's going on here. This is not a project moving in some sort of linear fashion from enslavement to freedom. It is uh, an imperial colonial project that, it, that uh, as some of my colleagues have been pointing out, uh, to, even to my own terror, it can actually get worse. Like we're conditioned to think that everything's just gonna keep getting better from plantation to some sort of futuristic better. But I think we're mistaken if we look at it that way. And it can absolutely get worse. And then depending on how you look at it, in some cases it already is. Uh, so the function and development of mythology. I just want to, you know, uh, this great book I read some years ago about the regime called The Regime Change of Kwame Nkrumah from Ahmad Rahman. Uh, he says that the process of colonization was itself a far reaching psychological operation called psyops in the parlance of modern war warfare. Propaganda, myth making and the symbol and symbol manipulation were the colonial colonialists essential catechism for centuries. Colonialism itself was an ideology of combat, the metropoles propaganda symbol and myth-making were as crucial as bullets in the effort to pacify the colony. So again, myth-making propaganda are targeted, in this case, at black America as any other colonized community with the goal of pacifying the colony. Another great book that I, that I was put on to by John Potash, a Maryland-based uh, researcher who has done some incredible work into the real history of Tupac Shakur, which is timely and relevant. We have a great interview with him at imixwhatilike.org. If you want to get beyond this ridiculous film and see some of the politics, there's a lot of fascinating stuff. You should check it out. But he was a proponent, that is, uh, Potash is a proponent, uh, uh, and he put me on and some others to this great book uh, that came out in the early 90s called The Cultural Cold War, uh, The CIA in the World of Arts and Letters. And it's it's about how those in power view, whether we agree or not, it's important I think we understand how they view pop culture and media. And one of the things that they point out here is that propaganda was defined as any organized effort or movement to disseminate information or a particular doctrine by means of news, special arguments, or appeals designed to influence the thoughts and actions of any given group. A vital constituent of this effort was psychological warfare, which was defined as the planned use by a nation of propaganda and activities other than combat, which communicate ideas and information intended to influence the opinions, attitudes, emotions, and behavior of foreign groups in ways that will support the achievement of national aims. Further, the most effective kind of propaganda was defined as the kind where the subject moves in the direction you desire for reasons which he believes to be his own. It is useless to dispute these definitions. They are littered across government documents, the Donnays of American post-war cultural diplomacy. And I had to look that word up, Donnays. I'm not even front. I'm not going to try to pretend like I knew what it meant. It just basically means that the, it's like the raison d'etre. It's the, 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 the intent. It is the goal. It is, it is everywhere uh, about what the society wants. To, to create propaganda and psychological warfare targeted at uh, um, uh, subjected peoples, no, no, not the least of which are black or African descended peoples. And if we had time, I mean, if you get even into the, to the, the origins of the field of study for which I'm, I'm supposed to be a professional, communication studies, it is all about clearly written in the documents, the political and economic elite of this country saying we need to create communication studies so that we can teach new immigrant Europeans to be white and we can teach everyone else to play their roles as subservient non-humans. They're very clear. So that's why I like her quote there. All right. So quickly through the myth basics, and I'm, I'm not going to read all this because we're going to go through this one by one very quickly. Um, 
So I'll just do that because we're, we're running short. I don't take up too much time. The myth basics as, as far as, as uh, black buying power go. Part one. So I'm just trying to quickly lay the context, propaganda, colonialism, et cetera. So for this specific myth, and of course there are many, the claim that African America has roughly $1 trillion in buying power is popularly repeated mythology with no basis in sound economic logic or data. While the myth has a longer history, it is today largely propelled by misreadings and force or poor, poor or false interpretations of Nielsen surveys and marketing reports produced by the Selig Center for Economic Growth at the Terry College of Business housed in the Bank of America Financial Center in Athens, Georgia. That alone should stop everybody. So Bank of America is gonna produce studies that tell black people how powerful they are and that how, what they can actually do to overcome the inequality that they suffer. Red flags should have already been going up. But as we're gonna look at, most people don't even know this. And that's how propaganda works. And you all saw Inception. Is that too old a movie? Mm -hmm. Did anybody not see Inception? Okay, I, I like to bring that up because it's, it's, it goes back to that point of propaganda, the, the film with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And the point of that film is how do they develop the ability to implant ideas so deep in someone's mind that they just think that they came to that conclusion on their own without being influenced. And propaganda is meant to work the exact same way. So one of the ways to do that is to make sure that people are never in touch with the actual source of the commentary. If you can disassociate the origins and just have people focus on a catchphrase, one trillion dollars in buying power, then it's easier to, to have that um, manipulate people and then for, for them to assume that this is true and start to operate that way and regurgitate this myth, usually for an applause line uh, at, a, at a gathering like this. People will say to brothers and sisters, we got a money chain down. And everybody's like, yes! Yes, if we would just stop buying the shoes and the weed and the, we would, yes! And then you... So, and a lot of, you know, some of my favorite, this, the myth is old. I'm, I'm still trying to identify the actual origins of it. It's, it's, it's uh, I've not been able to get the exact start of it, but, but people going back to Malcolm X in the 50s have, have you, I mean, and I love Malcolm, but this is one area he just made a mistake. Dr. King ran with this myth incorrectly misunderstanding what, what was being said. Uh, Minister Farrakhan just said it on radio the other day in a, in a well re retweeted video clip and everybody's online tweeting, yes, the minister. So this is how, I, I just thought I would give a quick example of how this works and then we will get, I'm gonna get to the, the details in just a minute. So reports like this come out all the time. Yeah. And we see them splattered across popular media and refer to constantly the state of black America with Urban League just ran it again. Uh, the, I mean, constantly. <clears throat> but nobody looks into the, the, where, the, where, where the data, quote unquote, is coming from. So the report comes out and says, we, we have a trillion dollars. Now this is what part of the report actually said. One of the mistakes that is made is that, to their credit, Nielsen and the Selig Center are honest about what their reports are. They're saying, they're, they're clear, we are not saying black people have this much wealth. We're saying that they have this much buying power. What buying power means gets lost in the translation, and by the time we hear it in popular media regurgitated to us, it has no basis in reality. So to this, um, to that level, I have to give them at least some credit for not being dishonest. So this is what the report says. Despite historically high unemployment rates, blacks have shown resiliency in their ability to persevere as consumers. Black buying power continues to increase, rising from its current $1 trillion level to a forecasted $1.3 trillion by 2017. It's like a backhanded comment. <laughs> Of course, but it also doesn't make any sense if you think buying power means actual economic strength. It only makes sense if you understand, as we'll get to in just a moment, what buying power from their point of view actually does mean. Oh, how much is a, uh, is a hundred billion is one trillion? No, I think it's a thousand billion, okay, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not, yeah. I don't do math either. <laughs> All right, so, but, so this is what's quoted in the, this is what the report says, but what people end up only quoting is the one line, 
black buying power continues to increase. That's the only part they see. And then people, because we're, especially in today's world, we don't do research, we don't follow the footnotes, we just quote and say, say something that sounds good, it's good at 140 characters, it's gonna get me the applause line, it's gonna get me uh, uh, quoted in somebody's paper. But we don't ask where it's coming from. The Selig Center for Economic Growth. All of these, and the reason I drew it this way is that all of these footnotes, if you ever start to follow it, all of them from Nielsen, everywhere that honestly uh, cites their work points back to the Selig Center for Economic Growth. All of them come back to this one source. So what are they saying? Where are they getting these numbers from? Well, the Selig Center says buying power is disposable income or the total personal income available for spending on goods and services after taxes. Simply defined, buying power is the total personal income of residents that is available after taxes for spending on virtually everything they buy, but it does not include dollars that are borrowed or that were saved in previous years. And this is where they're most honest. It is not a measure of wealth. It does not include, and it does not include what tourists spend in their visits. Now, I've tried to break this, this statement down for years with several other economists trying to get some help on this. And one of the things I've found, unfortunately, is that I have not found anyone else who's tried to tackle this particular mythology. So a lot of the economists I reach out to end up saying, wow, I never even thought about that before. But you're right, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but when we looked at this line, what we basically can conclude, because one of the problems with this line is, and this is where people make the mistake. So a lot of people will go around and say, we do have this much money, Dr. Ball or Jared or whoever. Stop hating. It says all the money we have after our goods and services and after taxes, making it seem like people have this money, they pay their bills, and then they choose then to go out and buy the weed and the hair and whatever else. But this is not, this is in itself misleading, including the line about that it does not include dollars that are borrowed in previous years. And there's a lot more to this uh, that maybe we can come back to if, if, if we have a particular question about it, but the reality is, as real wages have stayed the same since the 1970s, but production has gone up. The gap to keep people buying the overproduced goods that they can no longer afford with their salaries was closed with credit card debt. So to say that people are spending money after they pay their bills, not including credit cards makes it seem like, again, that black people have all this money, when in reality, the average black household is, has a net worth of $1,700 and an average credit card debt of six to $7,000. So you can't be financially strong if your net worth is six times less than your credit card debt. But anyway. But this is what the, the Selig Center also does that, that takes us away from the soundness of any economic logic. They say that black people are gonna have buying power based on these arbitrary, speculative concepts. For instance, black population growth. So there's more black people, that means that there will be more black people to spend money, so therefore black buying power goes up. But does a simple fact of procreation mean economic strength? No. Increased job opportunities. Well, we know that the Economic Policy Institute has called black America's a permanent recession, meaning that no matter how good the economy does, black people don't do well. And they said that we have the lowest or the highest long-term unemployment rate since 1942. This Statistic also, by the way, doesn't say anything, or statistics, not a stat, this claim doesn't say anything, especially when we look at what jobs black people are getting. If black people are paid 50 to 60 cents on the dollar compared to whites, and for women it's even worse, if working age black and brown women have a, if single individual working age black and brown women have a net worth of $5, what are we saying about the increased job opportunities? Is it another job working part-time at a fast food place? Is it a job, is it the third or fourth job someone has? Is it an increased job opportunity to work somewhere where you're underpaid and first fired? 
In other words, there's nothing specified in that claim. They just put it out there. More education for black America. A number of economists have pointed this out, including the, the, uh, the popular Sandy Darity, who we're going to refer to in just a moment, have pointed out that education does nothing, has, has no impact on black income. Black college degrees are paid at the same rates as white high school diplomas. And then if you're talking about higher level education, the last report that came out that put, uh, showed the statistic for the amount of black PhDs in the country it had less than 1%, it had an NA, didn't even have a percentage point. So if the idea is that education opportunities are increasing, and that is supposed to increase black America's buying power, it's clearly seen as, or should, should be at this point, clearly uh, uh, seen as fraudulent in that having more education does not translate to more money. My favorite one, and I'll move on from here, is where they say, uh, number four, only 8.1% of black America is over 65, of, of 65 years of age, or at the career pinnacles, at which point wage increases decelerate, whereas whites are 13 and a half percent over 65. So they're trying to say here that because there are fewer black people over 65, there are more black people who will spend more money. But they don't say that there are fewer black people over 65 because black people die earlier than whites. So how, again, does that make you economically strong if you can't even live as long as white people? My point here is that, I'm, I'm trying to go very quickly, but my point here is that the Selig Center from which all of these concepts of buying power emerge are basing this not on anything real about what black people have economically, but are basing it on spurious and arbitrary, unsubstantiated claims about what will make a community stronger economically. And then on top of that, their reports are misunderstood and misquoted, uh, where as they are very clear about what economic power, or buying power actually is, we assume something else, or we are told by spokespeople that it's something else. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. And I also add that our, our social security benefits are not tailored to our life expectancy. So we should be getting our money sooner. Of course. Nice. That's my point. Again, that's my point. But here they're trying to say that because black people, well, they're not saying it. They're saying because there are fewer black people over 65, right. at which point people stop spending as much, black buying power is going up. But this is really, and part number two here, myth basics number two is really the crux of, of, of why this is misunderstood. Buying power is a marketing phrase that refers only to the power of consumers to purchase what is stri are strictly available goods and is used as a measurement for corporations to better market their products. Power here has nothing to do with the actual economic strength with actual economic strength, and there's no collective $1 trillion that black people have and just foolishly spend ignorantly to their economic detriment. Marketing, it's a marketing phrase. When you read the Nielsen reports, in fact, as we can look at the same one, I just pulled this piece out here, they say it. The reports have become, the Nielsen reports have become widely respected industry chronicles touted for their exclusive insights, data, trends, and perspectives that better prepare marketers and brands to connect with this audience segment. So they're saying, this is not about black people having a bunch of money that they can use to improve their communities and, and turn into a revolutionary society. This is about how do we tell companies to, char to market their products to various different communities so that they can get the money that they have available to them to spend on these available goods. In other words, flip it the other way. If the myth were true, or if people, if it were to be believed that there was this trillion dollars that black people have and could just spend any way black people choose to, the question still become come under uh, come uh, under a capitalist economy. Not the well, the number of them come. You can't buy what's not for sale. If one percent of the, I think it's if it's what is it? The top one percent own almost almost like forty percent of all the stock. Five white people in this country own more land than all the black people combined. Um, five, five, the four, well, they're the top five, four of the richest individual men in the world, according to Forbes, are white Americans. Those four alone have a combined net worth that's more than all of black people combined. So even if there was this money in black people's hands, what could they buy with it? 
You can't buy land that someone else owns. You can't buy stock that someone else owns. You can't invest in businesses that uh, are owned by others that won't accept your investment. So what? Actually, it's like my it's like my 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 joke with my students about this whole thing of, I wish every black person did follow all the mythologies that we're told we're supposed to follow, and everybody wake up tomorrow and change their name to Mike and Samantha, and everybody change their hair and put on a suit and do all the things. Women take out the braid. Everything we're told we're supposed to do to be properly functioning people, and be out at the bus stop at five in the morning, because by noon we would be in a state of revolution because then everybody would realize it has nothing to do, inequality and poverty has nothing to do with my behavior, with my dress, with my look. It has nothing to do with any of that. We are poor because capitalism requires it. And for there to be a 1%, quite obviously, there has to be a 99. The myth of buying power functions as propaganda, working to deny the reality of structural, intentional, and necessary economic inequality required to maintain society as it is, one that benefits an increasingly decreasing number of people. To do this, the myth functions to falsely blame poor people for being poor. Poverty, the myth encourages, is the result of the poor having little to no financial literacy or is resulting from their bad spending habits when in reality, poverty is an intended result of an economic and social system where we simply can called capitalism tone talks brings to you the difference between black wealth and white wealth explained in less than two minutes in america we think that we understand race wealth and how the two intertwine we believe in a sharing of wealth among the races that largely does not exist the truth is by the data there are really hardly any blacks that are millionaires in the united states and whites largely own almost all of the personal wealth in the country According to Demos.org, white America owns 90% of the national wealth, with the top 50% of white families holding 88% of all of America's personal wealth in their bank accounts. Despite having billionaire Oprah Winfrey, of the 14 million black families, less than a few hundred thousand of these households are worth more than a million dollars, and that number is shrinking. While at the same time, over eight and a half million white families are worth more than a million dollars. Adding to this, Almost all of the 540 American billionaires are white as well. In fact, according to a report by Credit Suisse, to be in the top 5% of black families, you only need to be worth $356,000, including your house. All while just the top few hundred white American families are worth more than all of black America combined. Subscribe to learn more at ToneTalks.org. So now, if, if, if there was an honest recounting of the condition, that's where we should start. Not with, we have a trillion dollars of buying power and look how well we're doing. By the way, they also say Native Americans have $98 billion in buying power, which is fascinating considering that most live off of less than $2 a day. But again, if you're only counting what passes through us as a sieve, rather than what actually increases wealth, then of course you can make these claims. I get a paycheck. I then just did it the other day. Almost all of it immediately. I mean, in my, I look at my account and like for one half a day, it's like, oh yeah, all right, I'm good. But then here come all the apps. Your bill is due, your bill is due, your bill is due. And by the time I finish, I'm, I have that money literally like one day. And it just passes through me. Now, you could say, well, he could have bought a cheaper computer. He didn't have to buy this phone. He didn't have to get a car. He didn't have to, he could, he could buy less clothes or go to less movies or whatever, whatever, and say that all of us could do the same. But then let's just follow that through. If I took all the money that I spend on that, doing that and, and didn't do that, where would I go with that money? And what would I replace those products with? Or what could I do with all the money I ended up saving? If you just start to think about how much you spend and then think about what would happen if you didn't spend any of that for a year and just saved it and then took that pot and then thought the way we're encouraged to think, well, then here's a number of things that happen. One, if you don't go to the hairdresser or to the clothing store or wherever, then those businesses die. Those people starve. They, they lose their homes. They lose their whatever. Capitalism works by circulating capital. It must keep moving. 
if you save it and don't spend it, the system will collapse. If you, which would, maybe that's desirable, but in the process of that, a lot of other people are gonna be hurt. A lot of people that depend on your little bit of spending are gonna be hurt. Let's extend that. If all of us did that and we took, our, we took all that money, we didn't buy anything all year and we kept the same shoes and the same shirt and the same car and the same hair and the same computer and the same phone and the same, 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 same. And we just bootlegged all our movies, which is, you know, and we did all of that. And we came together at the end of the year and we said, we're gonna pool all that money. And now all of us in this room, let's say, I don't know, I don't know, I'm guessing we might come up with a couple hundred thousand dollars. I don't even think, I think that's a lot. That's not probably real either. But let's just say we did, a couple hundred thousand dollars. What do we do with that money? Where are we gonna go with that money? First of all, it's just a couple hundred thousand dollars. That is not enough to overturn the inequality in this economy. It's not enough to invest in something that's going to create wealth down the line that you can then hand down to your kids and grandkids and great grandkids like wealth is done within wealthy communities. So basically, finally, much of the framing around wealth disparity, including the use of alternative financial service products, focuses on the poor financial choices and decision making on the part of largely black, Latino, and poor borrowers, which is often tied to a culture of poverty thesis regarding an undervaluing and low acquisition of education. They go on to say, Race is a stronger predictor of wealth than class itself. For instance, blacks and Latinos collectively make up 30% of the US population, but collectively own only about 7% of the nation's private wealth. That's Derek Hamilton and William Darity Jr., two big time economists from a recent uh, uh, study that they produced, which again was saying, as I've been trying to say, and why I highlighted the term framing, the way this is framed, the way we are told all of this is happening is meant to encourage that, uh, that we understand that our poverty is our own fault and that we can spend ourselves into freedom. So as I'll just conclude here, uh, I'll just stop here and then maybe we can get into some more details. Um, anyone, including black leaders, who parade fanciful numbers before their unsuspecting audiences so as to again suggest that irresponsibility is the cause of black poverty need to be checked vigorously. We need to get back to an increased intelligent and honest discussion of economics so we can be where Kwame Ture was when he left. Happy birthday the other day. Uh, as he and his comrades always said when answering a phone or when saying goodbye, ready for the revolution. Um, and essentially, that's where I would want to stop, that I am ready for a revolution, and we need to have one if this is going to be upended. And we cannot get there by telling people, black people in particular, that they can spend themselves out of poverty when we don't have any money. Number one, we don't have any money. And then number two, more importantly, capitalism as an economic model requires inequality, requires the kind of uh, instability that we, we see and we face today. And my last point on that is that the state itself only exists to allow capital to form and exploit the rest of us. So the country is only relatively important to those in power as an organizing mechanism. That's why I started the way I started on this issue of colonialism. All of the countries in the world were established to allow capital to exploit various peoples in various parts of the world uh, um, more easily. So. Uh, anyway, I think that's how we need to look at what the situation we're in here um, with the, in relationship to the United States. And we need to politely, I tried to challenge, you know, I, 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 maybe we, I'll use this as a segue. I tried to challenge the, 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 the return to this myth that I saw come out of BLM in LA, I think, with the, with the Visa debit card. Um, where they said, I don't know if you all, to what extent you all were, uh, you may have all been dealing with it quite intensely, but they said that this black bank was uniting with Black Lives Matter, partnering, it said, with Black Lives Matter, to harness black buying power. And I just, I read that and I cringed, not because I don't support Black Lives Matter, but because I do support it. And I wouldn't want to see any uh, organization or entity that is moving in a direction I think we need to move in be caught up again in this mythology. So I wanted to try to, 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 to address it. But a lot of, I think, Maybe it's my own approach, maybe it's my personality, but I think a lot of it has to do with the defensiveness around critique, um, around how maybe BLM is being critiqued publicly, and I didn't want to be seen as being folded in with that nonsense, but at the same time, I do think to, the, to whatever extent, as I've said here, 
that anyone wants to lead us in that direction, they need to be checked. And some of my favorites from Malcolm to Dr. King and many others have fallen for this myth. Um, and and uh, we need to do more to challenge it. And this has just become my own particular pet peeve. And I deeply appreciate the invitation and the chance to try to talk with you about it uh, because it does not happen very often. So I'll stop there and, and thank you all very much. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.